Great, let's begin. I know it's 12.02 and we have so much to cover. I know people are still joining on Zoom and on Facebook Live, so please feel free to continue joining. Um, again, feel free to put your name, your location, and how you are connected to University of Haifa in the chat and any questions you may have in the Q&A section on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Naomi Reinhartz. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of University of Haifa. Um, we are so appreciative to have all of you joining us today from literally around the US and around the world. Um, today's webinar is again, co-sponsored by Rabbi Arthur Wiener and the JCC of Paramus Congregation Beth Tikva in New Jersey. Uh, there's perhaps no one on earth more immersed in the world of Israeli intelligence than a director of the Mossad. And today we're thrilled and honored to have Tamir Pardo join us. He held the prestigious and influential position between the years of 2011 and 2016. Mr. Pardo joined the Mossad in 1980, taking part in several classified operations, and he was awarded the Israel Prize, the Israel Security Prize three times. Rising through the ranks of the Mossad, he became the head of the Keshet Department, uh, where he was responsible for operations, including obtaining electronic intelligence through wiretaps and photographic methods. He also served as a senior advisor for operations to the general staff of the Israel Defense Forces serving in that position during the 2006 Lebanon War. Since he stepped down from the Mossad in 2016, Mr. Pardo has been a high profile expert and commentator in the realm of assessing Israel's array of security threats. We're also delighted to again welcome back Duby Weissglass, who's the chair of the executive committee of University of Haifa and the former director general of Israel's prime minister's office under Ariel Sharon. In his role um, as director general of Israel's prime minister's office, Duby served as a diplomatic delegate for negotiation with the US national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, and with the US secretary of state, Colin Powell, and he was one of the key architects of the Israeli disengagement from Gaza in 2005. Today's webinar brings you a unique and behind the scenes perspective on Israel's war with Hamas, uh, Israel's attempts to negotiate a ceasefire agreement and bring home the remaining hostages, and Israel's efforts to determine a post-war game plan for Gaza. I wanna also take this opportunity to welcome back all of our supporters of ASUH and University of Haifa, again, from our, across the US and around the world. With the university opening its doors on December 31st and resuming studies for all of their students after a few months of delay due to the ongoing war with Hamas in Gaza, uh, university of Haifa has served as a catalyst for healing between Israel's different ethnic communities. As Israel's most diverse campus with 40% of the student body consisting of Muslims, Christians, Druze, and Bedouins, for 50 years, the University of Haifa has played and will continue playing a central role in ensuring that all sectors of the Israeli population unite to nurture a beautifully diverse civic society. The role of University of Haifa is more important than ever today, with the university establishing a paradigm for tolerance and coexistence and potentially he healing throughout Israeli society. If you'd like to support our work, you can visit asuh.org slash donate. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanna take this opportunity to thank every one of you who has supported our scholarship fund for reserve soldiers during this extremely challenging time. Over the past four plus months, we've had 1500 students and 50 faculty members serving in the reserves, including 300 students in the security forces. We've been providing emergency scholarships of around $500 to every one of these student soldiers. With your help, we can continue to increase this fund and support these people who are on the front lines defending Israel and to make sure they have the financial assistance that they and their families really need as they try to return to some degree of normal life um, back at the University of Haifa. So without further ado, I'm delighted again to welcome the former head of the Mossad, Tamir Pardo, and Mr. Duby Weissglass to all of our listeners today. We will have a dedicated Q&A section at the end of the webinar, so please continue to leave your questions for uh, Mr. Pardo and Mr. Weissglass in the Q&A box um, on Zoom or on the comment section on Facebook. Um, we will also be recording this session and sharing it with all of you after the fact on social media and in our newsletter and on our website. So, uh, Duby, I turn it over to you uh, to start today's webinar. So, hello, thank you, and uh, shalom, everybody. I would like again to thank Amir Pardo for his willingness to discuss with us all these uh, critical issues. Um, there are very few Israelis who are so extensively involved in Israel security for so many years, like Tamir Pardo. As a soldier in an elite unit, 
by the way, he took part at the famous Entebbe uh, raid at the time, and later on as a, in the Department of Operation of the Mossad, and of course as a chief of uh, the director of the Mossad. Tamir has the operational, the political, the diplomatic perspective of this combination of issues that get that engaged in this incredible complexity of events that uh, we are now and in his he will discuss with you what are the reasons behind this incredible failure of Israel intelligence system as well as the military in its operational aims what are the uh, key action to be taken to release the hostages to bring an end to this tragedy of people kept prison in, in Gaza, how he predict or visioning the post-war realities uh, in Gaza, how he predict the development in our northern border, which is getting uh, harder and harder, unfortunately, from a day to day. And also, finally, if we'll have the time, we would like to hear his opinion about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is back on the agenda, given that sometime in the past, it was Mr. Pardo who stated that, that, they could, that what he believed, the, Palestine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, imposes a threat to Israel, which might be even equal or even worse than the Iranian conflict. So, Tamir, thanks again for this incredible opportunity to meet with you and to discuss with you this issue, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duby. Thank you. And uh, it's a great honor being here tonight. Uh, well, it's my night. Probably it's morning somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, how to start? On my desk for many years, I had a small book that was written by a Chinese philosopher 2,500 years ago, The Art of War. I think it's one of the most important books that any commander, any politician, or even a businessman should read at least one time. It was on my desk, and there is a, a phrase there that is uh, was always in front of me for all my career. It says, when you know yourself and you know your enemy, you will win every battle. When you don't know yourself and you know your enemy, or you know your enemy and you don't know yourself, you will win once and you lose once. When you don't know yourself and you don't want your enemy, you lose the battle. You don't have any 1% chance to win it. On October the 7th, we met our failure was because we didn't know ourselves, unfortunately, and we didn't know our enemy. Sinwar, uh, as uh, let's say the chief, the prime minister, whatever, the leader, of the Hamas in Gaza was in prison for many, many years in Israel. He was, he was Hebrew speaking, fluent as Arabic. He knew us. He knew us very well. He knew our advantages and disadvantages. And when he released, was released uh, after the Shalit let's say, uh, agreement that we released uh, 1,300 uh, 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 terrorists. And I'll just add one sentence here because it may lead to what we should do. I was a director of the Mossad uh, uh, when it happened, when uh, we released uh, um, more than 1,000 terrorists for one soldier. And I remember that day, and I was asked uh, by Prime Minister Netanyahu before the um, uh, 
government meeting that uh, should approve that uh, 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 how to solve the case of uh, of uh, Gilad Shalit. And he asked me, uh, I would like you, and told me, I would like you that uh, you will recommend uh, that uh, we'll do it for 1,000 to one. And uh, I said, uh, I don't think that I should be, take part in this uh, uh, meeting. I can send my wife. He looked at me and said, uh, why do you say so? I said, look, if you're going to ask me from um, the intelligence point of view, from the operational point of view, it's insane to release all those terrorists, including Sinwar, for one soldier. But if we're talking about morality, if we're talking about being Jewish, so that's another question. So the question is not, is it right to release them? As a director of the Mossad, the answer is negative. But as a Jew, I said, yes, we should go for it. Even though I knew that after quite short time, we'll meet some of those terrorists back in the streets trying to kill us. And that was, let's say, in 2011. On that morning of October the 7th, uh, I, it was uh, Simchat Torah Saturday, Sukkot, the last day of Sukkot, and uh, I was at home. Um, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm getting a call from my daughter. Uh, my daughter and my son-in-law and three uh, grandchildren are living, uh, uh, let's say, a bit north from Netanya, in a small place. And my daughter said, look, uh, your son-in-law um, got a call at 6.30 in the morning from a very good friend that they were friends uh, since they were uh, 10 or 11 years old. And now my son-in-law is 50 years old. And both uh, 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 were in primary school, high school, and they both of them served in the Navy SEALs of Israel for five years. And uh, the two family was really an excellent relationship, best friends. And he got a call at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.30, said, look, I need you. It was a small place near Gaza border. He took his revolver, he took the car, started to drive all the way to Gaza, picking up uh, two other good friends from the Navy SEALs, uh, driving towards uh, uh, the Tiba Sara. Before achieving the place, he got a call that his best friend was killed. And the brother of his best friend was killed as well. Then he got another call, said, look, we need you in a kibbutz that is under attack. So he drove his car, three people with a revolver, entering that kibbutz. And after half an hour or so, he was wounded twice. And uh, rescued later on by a, a, a tank that uh, the commander was a, a young lady, sergeant, they drove into the kibbutz and uh, actually re rescued him. And now he's okay. What really, really happened and why it happened on that Saturday? That was the most devastating attack on Israel. Within a few hours, let's say seven or eight hours, we lost 1,400 people. How it happened? According to Israel doctrine from 1948, no one 
can attack Israel and conquer Israel and manage to capture the land, Israeli land. The doctrine was, any case, we should transfer the war to the land of our enemy. We're a small country. We cannot afford it. That was the main doctrine of Israel defense. That was, it's written everywhere. In the Israeli defense forces, we know it. And then, within less than an hour, 3,000 terrorists and others managed to capture the western part of the Negev. Let aside for a second what they did, rapes, murdering people, killing babies, children, old women and old people. Think about the attack from the military point of view. It was an amazing success. Israel, with the best army in the Middle East, and not only the Middle East, with the best intelligence services. Who was there on the other side? At the end of the day, it was a bunch of terrorists with the Toyotas as their vehicles, with AK-47 Klachnikovs rifles, 50 years old rifles, in a small place that is twice big as the Galilee, Lake of Galilee. 2.4 million people there. that they can't move in or out, and all their needs are supplied by smuggling, actually from Egypt. And we, the, we with our best armed forces, with F-35, F-16, 15, with the uh, armored divisions, what happened to us? How it happened? That's the biggest question today and for the last four months. I can give you my assessment before um, investigation, proper investigation will start, if it will start one day. For me, it's quite obvious. There was an understanding, a false understanding that uh, I remember uh, Prime Minister Sharon saying, if you have a terrorist group, okay, there is only one way to deal with it. Smash them and kill them all. They will have, before getting killed, they will have two options. Or to be killed or to change themselves from a gang, terrorist gang, to a political party. As long as it's a terrorist group, there is no deterrence. You cannot deter a terrorist group. It knows from history, okay? Try to check in the last uh, 150 years. That the, was the only way to defeat terrorist group or to convince them to turn to the political one. We saw it in Ireland, okay, for instance, or kill them. Almost until the last, then they will have no power. Unfortunately, in Israel, there was a belief that there was a deterrence, that they will sit, if they will sit, and in front of them, they're gonna have to take all the figures of the Israeli forces, intelligence, and capabilities, and then put on the other side, their capabilities, 
there's no one chance, one in 100, that they will be able to defeat us. So we were in a situation that we didn't understand who is our opponent. And I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a director, I was a, I had a meeting with one of the, let's say, leaders in the countries that are surrounding us. And he told me, he told me a story. He said, look, there is a 12 years old Palestinian guy in Gaza that his father is not a Hamas. And uh, he had, uh, he's selling uh, tomatoes in the Gaza market. And the kid told his father, look, I saw that there is a small box under yours and mom bed. Man, and uh, there are, I found there 10,000 shekels. And I know, I read in the internet, that there are options that we can take a vacation in Greece for one week and it'll cost all the family only 5,000 uh, shekels. We can take, it's less than two hours uh, a flight from Ben Gurion Airport. Let's do it. The father was furious for the kid what he did, how he, uh, uh, he found this uh, box, and so on and so forth. And then he told him, look, my dear son, we can't do it. The son, the, the kid said, so father, maybe we'll be able to do it next year. He said, no, son, we won't be able to do it. He said, well, in three years, my daughter, she will be 17 years old. She'll graduate high school. Maybe we'll, then we'll do it. He said, no, kid, we won't be able to do it. Not now, never. So then the kid said, so you mean, father, that I have to join the Hamas and start to dig tunnels? That was a story that was taught to me by one of the leaders. He said, look, you don't understand what's happening in Gaza. You think that by controlling it, will be able to handle the situation. One day will come and you'll get a hit. And it happened 10 years later. It's not that we were sleeping in our sleeping bags because we didn't understand the situation. We got and we're going to see it in the future. We got in, we got the intelligence hints enough. But the Hebrews, the thought that we are the strongest in the region, that the Hamas is deterred, they will never try to do it. We convinced ourselves. And when, and even when we saw all those red blips light, we said, no, it's impossible. They won't do it. And, uh, you know, when you are dealing with the armed, uh, armed forces or uh, any uh, uh, defense institute, you know that at the end of the day, you have more threats than capabilities. Those days, the biggest threat was in the best band because uh, uh, we had some problems there because of our extreme right government. And the majority of uh, our armed forces were deployed in the West Bank. We evacuated the majority of our forces from the Northern frontier, the Lebanese one. And we took uh, the majority of our battalions from uh, Gaza border. So we were left without defense, but with an understanding that there is a deterrence. At the end of the day, when we got the hints, we didn't believe the hints. We didn't believe the red lights. Those who were um, in charge took the wrong decision. 
it could have been very, very easy to avoid this day. But um, because we thought we are better, because of the deterrence, and because the understanding that uh, our government, by um, allowing fortune to enter Gaza, directly to Hamas by the Qataris, and allowing a uh, 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 Palestinian to go and work in Israel just uh, 10 days before that attack. The Israeli government and the Israeli armed forces and intelligence services were in a state of mind that there is no war. And the hints are false hints. So that was the case. The chief of staff, the chief of intelligence within the military, the chief of uh, internal security services, and many high rank officers said already a few hours afterwards that they are taking the responsibility. And the meaning that I understand it, and uh, we all understand it in Israel, that. Uh, a minute after the war will end, they will ask a permission to leave and uh, they will go home. And I believe they will have a lot of things to think about for the rest of their lives. The point is that our politician on the other side and our prime minister uh, don't think that it was his responsibility. From my point of view, for the military fuck up or fault, he was not responsible. For what happened that night, by understanding or not understanding those red lights, he was not responsible. But he was responsible for the strategy. He was the one, and his governor was the one, that created allowed to create this monster in Gaza by not thinking about what was is discussed now, the day after. The day after started years ago, decades ago. What the hell we should do with the Palestinian case? From the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, there are 15 million people that are living half Jews, and half non-Jews. What is our vision? Big question mark. As uh, Secretary Dr. Henry Kissinger said, Israel doesn't have foreign policy. Israel doesn't have strategy. Israel discuss a deal only with internal problems. And for, unfortunately, uh, we reached the point after 75 years that we, we are at a very delicate situation. And we don't have any other choice today but to think on the day after. How we would like to see the state of Israel. One state between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. If that will be the state of Israel, I guess that in 10, 15 years, the name will not be the state of Israel and the Knesset will be a majlis, the Arabic name for the parliament because I don't think that there is an option that uh, within one state, there are gonna be two or three kind of citizenship. Those who got full rights and those who doesn't. So in the long run, if someone will decide that one state solution, that's a problem, that's gonna be against the Zionist vision. The other option, 
is a Jewish state, democratic Jewish state, within a border that is at least 75% of those who are living in are Jews. For the moment, we don't have any border. We're the only, the only state on this planet, okay, that has no borders. And uh, as I said, it uh, didn't start today. It started in 1967. That's the problem now in Israel. We're in the middle of a war. And we have to start to discuss our future. And uh, from my perspective, Israel is divided. In Israel, we have tribes. We have those tribes who believe in democracy, who believe in understanding that uh, all people are equal, that you cannot have people that are, um, let's say, members of the community, and they are citizens of the state that cannot vote for the parliament, they cannot don't have equal rights. That's one part, that's one tribe. There is um, a tribe um, that um, actually don't care about it. That are those that, what do you call the Haredim? They don't care which kind of solution will be taken. They're looking about themselves. And there we have the extreme right that I that believe in Armageddon. That uh, today we're starting to fulfill their dreams, the big war. The war in Gaza. And I guess you heard about that they want to uh, restart the settlements in Gaza. They are thinking about the West Bank. And uh, they think, they believe that uh, Israel should be a Jewish, Jewish state controlled only by Jews from the Mediterranean to Jordan River. That's a World War III in many ways today. And we have a part, some part of, uh, let's say, a majority that uh, uh, never thought about the problem. You must understand, we must understand that uh, um, um, it was 1967, was more than 55 years ago. Actually, it's almost three generations. People who there were kids in 1940, in 1967, when they got grandchildren that are going to be almost in the army, sent to join the army. So the problem is not known, not understood within the majority of Israelis. And the politicians are experts in hiding it. But what happened just a year ago after the last election and the thought of the extreme right government to create, to do a takeover of the state of Israel as a super extreme right, I say one said that they're going to be a KKK system. And uh, fortunately, we managed to stop it somehow, but the war started. And what happened on the day that the war will end, I hope that we'll come to the understanding that we have to solve our problems and not uh, 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 trying to um, hide it and to think that it will be solved by itself. For the moment, as you know, uh, from the second day of the war, or from October the 8th, uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, of course, uh, President Biden, asked 
begged Israel to say, what is our vision? How do we see the day after? And until now, there's no answer. And uh, from someone who is now quite an old guy, and I was a young soldier in uh, 1973 in the Yom Kippur War. If we won't have the day after strategy, this war will never end. Few words on the um, Lebanon. Lebanon is it's a bit, it's different. It's not like Gaza. Lebanon is an independent state with a, um, a president, a prime minister, and a strange political party named Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a Shia Lebanese party. They are not Iranian. They are Lebanese, but Shia. And uh, it's a party that today they hold there and the older party that uh, support Hezbollah from day one, they have 62 seats in the uh, Lebanese parliament out of 129, I think. Almost the majority. They were, they were serving until the last let's say problem, crisis with the Lebanese government as ministers in the Lebanese government. So this is a political party that has an army and they have missile capabilities that is larger than NATO, exclude the United States. They have more than 200,000 rockets, missiles, drones, And, uh, but it's Lebanon. There is a pol very simple political solution to that case. And the solution is one state, one uniform, one armed forces. For the moment, there's something that is unique in the world. Hezbollah is 10 times greater than the Lebanese army, and they managed to play in Lebanon as a guerrilla or as a terrorist group that when they do attack Israel, Israel cannot retaliate against Lebanon. That's insane. I said more than 30 years ago that the solution is not to fight with Hezbollah. And just to tell the United States of America, France, and the Saudis Emirates, that they have one week, one month, to convince the Lebanese government that the Hezbollah armed forces will be painted and declared as the Lebanese army. And if Lebanon wants a war with Israel, it's going to be a sad day for Lebanon. And now, just uh, one week ago, just this morning, there was an attack against Kiryat Shmone. A building got a direct hit. What should be our answer? We are attacking Hezbollah military posts. I'm saying no. If they attacked just a week ago an hotel in Metula that was evacuated, let's tell them to evacuate an hotel in Beirut or in Zahle, and they'll destroy it. There is no war 
between Israeli and some militia in Lebanon. In Lebanon. If someone wants a war, it's going to be war state versus state. And then I believe that Lebanon will never try to do anything because they need a quiet border. They need a peace, maybe not signed or declared, but as ipso facto in their area. So we let Hezbollah play, play without having to pay the price. And I believe that the solution is a political solution. And there is still enough room, enough time to do it. If we'll continue the way it does until now, and then we're gonna be a war. And we're gonna be very unpleasant to us, but much more to the other side. And again, we should think about the post-war strategy there as well. And if you won't do it, so it's gonna be again a vicious circle. Okay, that's until now. I think I answered some of your questions. If you have more, I'm ready to answer. Jimmy, do you want to go off mute? I say thank you, Tamir. And uh, Nomi, will you deliver some of the questions you've got from the audience? Of course. Of course. Thank you so much, Tamir. That was really fascinating. And we're getting hundreds and hundreds of questions and comments in the chat. So let me try to consolidate. And you can take as many questions as you have time for. Um, okay feel free to, to combine them together. Um, obviously the question keeps coming up in the chat of what led to the catastrophic security failure on October 7th. How did Israeli intelligence not know anything about an imminent attack? How will Hamas and Hezbollah be contained um, if Iran, which is really obviously behind um, all of them is not uh, addressed or mitigated? And I'll also add, why was Hezbollah allowed to amass so many missiles and why was Hamas in Gaza allowed to do what it was doing in Gaza for so long, you know, amassing rockets, building the tunnels, et cetera. So um, if you want to combine those few questions to start. Um, Iran, until 2014, was the black sheep in the region. They were, let's say, under sanctions, uh, worldwide sanctions, actually. Um, after the agreement, or when the agreement was signed, a war was here in the region. ISIS was the worst, let's say, uh, uh, threat to the uh, stability of all the countries in the Middle East, and not only in the Middle East, but mainly in the Middle East. And there was an understanding that uh, uh, we'll never see, and it's right, that uh, boots of the ground will not come from the United States, from the UK, or any other Western countries. And immediately, and they, let's say, nor Iraq, okay, nor Syria, nor any other country that was really under attack those days were capable to deal with ISIS. A day after the JCPOA was signed, Iran, with Qasem Soleimani as the leader of the RGC, became the warrior that defeated ISIS. Actually, they defeated ISIS in, in Iraq, and they defeated with the help of the Hezbollah, ISIS in Syria as well. Um, in, uh, in Iraq, it was that American airplanes, aircraft attack Mosul 
from the air, but the ground forces were Qasim Soleimani forces. At the end of, uh, well, ISIS was defeated, a corridor between Tehran and the Mediterranean Sea was opened. They have uh, a major influence in Iraq. They have a major influence in Syria and the Hezbollah in Lebanon. So they were the winners of post PC of that agreement. And in that agreement, there were any good things and bad things as well. Because if the, that agreement was kept intact until 2031, the Iranians were in a situation without any capability at all. But uh, after uh, begging from the Israeli government, begging the Israeli government begged United States, President Trump, to um, stop and to abandon the agreement. A year later, the Iranians start their move towards nuclear, obtaining nuclear weapon. And today, there are few weeks, depends on their wish to obtain nuclear capability, military capability. Thanks to uh, stupid things that uh, we pushed the United States to do. So Iran is a threat, but Iran is a conventional threat more than ever because they have a major influence in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. Even though I still believe not to talk about the Houthis, okay, but uh, uh, I still believe that uh, before starting to deal with Iran, we have to um, solve our internal problem. They are much more acute. We are still, we, we suffered from, uh, let's say, from October the 7th attack. It was it humiliated Israel. We suffered from casualties, civilians that were murdered, kidnapped. But uh, um, at the end of the day, our military power remained intact. We can see for the last four months that our ground forces are doing an excellent job in the hardest, in the hardest playground in the world. It's a great mistake that we never assume that that's the situation in Gaza. But the moment that we understood it and they ordered and that our military forces were ordered to move in, they are doing the job in an excellent way. It's a matter of time until they will be defeated. But the, the, the defeat will not be a success until, um, unless we'll have a post-war strategy. It's gonna be a waste of lives if we won't do it. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll merge a few more questions for you. I appreciate um, your really thorough answers. Um, a few more questions. Is it possible to ever reduce the level of indoctrination in Gazan 
ideology and education. Obviously, there's a lot of talk right now of dismantling UNRWA. Um, there's probably other things that need to be done. Um, otherwise, on October 7th, as they've said themselves, will continue to happen again and again, um, despite, you know, whatever security we put in place. Um, you know, the Hamas charter will continue to call for the eradication and murder of, of Jews. So how do we change that education in Gaza to prevent that um, these types of terrorist attacks from happening again? Um, also, obviously, there's a lot of talk of considering the recognition of a Palestinian state coming from Biden and the White House. Um, do you think this will happen in the near future? There's obviously a lot of pushback right now saying that this is not the right time to call for a two-state solution. Um, can the White House push for that? What is the security implications of doing so? Um, and then maybe also, you know, are the Abraham Accords um, that were in place under Trump and Bibi still um, viable? Will they continue to happen now? Is now the right time to continue looking for peace with other Middle Eastern countries? Putting all those questions together, we'll <laughs> end the session tomorrow morning. And I'm, sure. I'm sure, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> what is Israel's vision? I remember that I asked, uh, uh, let's say, quite frequently, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, when uh, I was a director of the Mossad and he was a prime minister, I think I asked him that almost once a month. What is Israeli vision? What do we want? As those days, by uh, grandchildren who were really, really babies and very small children, I asked him, how do you see that my grandchildren when they're going to be 24, 25 years old, 30 years old, which kind of a country they will live in? There was never an answer, unfortunately. When you don't have an answer, so you're going to meet only problems and threats. I believe that the first thing that Israel should do, and I said it many times, to draw our borders. We are those who are in, let's say, it's in our hand. We control from the Mediterranean to, to, to the uh, Jordan Valley. It's all in our hands. Let's draw the borders. And all those who are gonna be within those borders, going to be Israel citizens with all rights. What's going to happen when you're crossing the border depends not on us, but on the Palestinians. Until Palestinians will not change their behavior, will control the area from security point of view. We'll have the keys of an entity that they will choose to have the moment that they will change the education, that they will change their doctrine, that they will change the view. Until then, we are not building villages there. We are not trying to enlarge the state of Israel. We are handling it, the keys in our hand, until they will choose what to do with it. They will need us as partners. The Israeli uh, income per capita in nine in 2022 was around fifty thousand dollars per year per capita. In Gaza it was fifteen hundred. In the West Bank it was thirty five hundred. For the moment, and I guess forever, unless something really will change, they 
they decided that the Central Bank of Israel is their central bank. Sinwar, continue to adopt the system that he giving the salary to all his workers that are being in tunnels in Israeli shekels. That we are collecting the taxes for Gaza and for the West Bank. They have to think if they want to be free, if they want to have their liberty, they have to change themselves. We will never be able to do it from them. No one can do it. And no one can do it. If Sweden thinks that they can do it, let them do it. I don't think that we can do it, nor the states. It's their decision to change their behavior. We cannot force it. They have to choose it. We have to create a situation that they will going to see the future in a positive way and then it will be done. For the moment, we don't have a vision, but because we don't have a vision, we don't give them a chance to have their own vision. We are much, we have the best armed forces in the region. We have, we are a rich country. We can take our decisions. We can have our own strategy. The moment we'll have it, we'll start to solve the problem. Thank you. Um, I know we're at the end of the hour, so I want to be um, fair to you and your time. Um, but I guess, is there anything that we haven't addressed that you'd like to deal with? I know that a lot of us involved with the University of Haifa are particularly concerned about the situation in the North and what could happen in the North. A lot of people are obviously focused on the South post October 7th, but obviously the North is also very much um, at risk and being affected with a lot of um, evacuees from that area. Um, is there anything you'd like to share about that um, or whatever you see as the future long-term uh, for Israel and its, and its neighbors? Um, my wife, as she was born in a kibbutz and nearby the Lebanese border. She got two brothers. One of them is still in the kibbutz in the north. So he is now a refugee from that kibbutz for the last four months with family in a hotel in a, somewhere in central Israel. The other brother is from Yad Mordechai. It's a kibbutz that's nearby Gaza. So he and his family are refugees for the last four months again in an hotel in central Israel. We have actually, from my point of view, the first priority today is to bring the hostages back. We should do whatever is needed. Our government should do whatever is needed to bring them back. All other things are second to come. For the moment, I don't think that that's the view of our government. It's going to be the greatest mistake Israel ever did since the creation of the state of Israel. If we will neglect those people to die there in Gaza, that's our first problem. The second problem that we have to solve is to create a situation that Israeli citizens will be able to live in peace and quiet wherever they are. I don't think it's a wise idea. I don't think anyone in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia or wherever, be ready to go that the child will grow up, uh, that they can 
hear a siren that lived in 15 seconds to go to a shelter. That's a situation in the last more than 20 years in Gaza, and it should be stopped. And now there is an opportunity to stop it. So to bring, to come to, uh, uh, arrive to a situation, to reach a situation that Israeli citizens can go back to their home, that's the second priority. And the third one is to kill all those bastards that uh, uh, did what they did on October the 7th. Besides that, we should have our vision, our strategy, and I believe to accept uh, President Biden's strategy about how Israel should behave in the Middle East should be part of an alliance with the moderate countries, with Saudi Arabia, with the Emirates, with Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, and be part of a Western alliance here, watching what's happening in Russia and China. For the moment, because we don't have any strategy, it can be created. And I think that, uh, by the way, that was even, that was Trump strategy as well. The Abram Accord was part one. And with Abram Accord, the initial plan was to create a ground for two-state solution. That was the plan. But it was abandoned. So Biden plan is not so different. And I think today after the Ukraine war, we did it badly for us as Israelis and Jews here in Israel and for the free world as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamir. Um, Doobie, if you wanna unmute, I'll let you um, wrap up our, our webinar. So uh, uh, first of all, again, to thank Tamir for these exciting, really exciting statements he had. And uh, I just uh, like, would like to uh, add one point. It's not that we do not have a strategy. We do have a strategy, which is very clear. I don't want to be a political, but this is something that cannot be ignored. Our government is controlled by the settlers. Good or bad, this is for maybe a different webinar. And the prime concern of the settlement, the settlement movement is to see the Palestinian Authority either disappeared or at least paralyzed. And this whole strategy that was developed since 2009, which is to find a sort of a modus vivendi with Hamas, and yet to try to let down the Palestinian Authority as much as possible, that's what, to a great extent, is behind these devastating events of October 7. This is the reason why Qataris were allowed to inject into Gaza between 30 to $40 million on a monthly basis. And this fortune given to Hamas in cash, assisted them in building up these enormous military capabilities. Those tunnels, which is uh, a city, undergrounded uh, city, etc. As long the policy of the current government is not to allow the Palestinian Authority to take part in any solution, nothing happens. So no one is willing to assume responsibility over Gaza, other than Hamas, of course. And, 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 and so we have this standstill, so the war goes on, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. So it's not, an absence, it's not an absence of strategy. It's a strategy which, at least in my view, 
which in my view, of course, and I reflect only my opinion, is the most destructive approach we we could ever find. And 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 Camille sort of very accurately sort of pointed out all the hazards and the risks to us as a democratic state, as a Jewish state, and as a state who's willing, and as a society who's willing, you know, to live. Uh, on a basis of a certain values which are Jewish and which are universal. Anyhow, thank you very much to all the audience. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the your involvement. And most of all, thank you very much, Tamir. And see you again. See you again in <laughs> the near future. And I'd like to just add to that. Thank you, Duby, for making this webinar happen. And thank you, Tamir, so much for your time. We really appreciate your wisdom. We've gotten hundreds of questions and comments in the chat. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to every single question. We will offer this uh, webinar as a recording in the next few days on our website, on YouTube, on our social media, and in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, please go to asuh.org to subscribe to our newsletter and um, feel free to join our future webinars, which will happen every couple of weeks, usually Wednesdays at this time. I want to thank again our sponsor, of today's webinar, Rabbi Arthur Wiener and the JCC of Paramus, Congregation Beth Tikva in New Jersey. Um, if you'd like to ask any further questions or get involved with us, please email info at ASUH.org. And again, for those willing and interested to help our student soldiers and our faculty soldiers at this time who are fighting for Israel and the reserves, please donate at ASUH.org slash donate. We really appreciate all of your support. Thank you again for joining us today, and we will see you um, in a couple of weeks. And thanks again to Tamir and Doobie.